Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today to Barry, Vicky, and all the team at ICMI. What an incredible mix of speakers to get the opportunity to follow, and what a wonderful audience to get to share uh, my messages with. And I'm really fortunate today to be able to talk to you about something I'm extremely passionate about, and that is the state of flux we find ourselves in in the world right now, all these challenges of change, the, you know, the, the transformation, the buzzwords that we hear around disruption, all of that, and what that means for our organizations, for our people, and for our leaders. Because despite hearing all of that language, our subconscious and often our conscious can be dominated by these things here, these 50 reasons and then some not to change, not to move, not to do things. And I'm sure, in fact, I see a few grins around the room as you read a couple of them, that you've heard these before in team meetings when you've been trying to advance an idea through an organization. I often think this sums it up best. When asked, would you rather work for change or just complain, 81% of respondents replied, do I have to pick? This is hard. And I feel often that's the baseline that we start with when we try and, and talk about change, when we try and think about how do we actually make it happen when the rubber meets the road. When we move it out of that ideas brainstorming session, we're trying to move a Titanic in a different direction, as big business leaders will often talk about, or how we try and rethink the way that we're tackling a social problem. And so I just wanted to share today a couple of quick nuggets that I've been able to garner from my experiences working with companies and nonprofits right around the world on how it is that we do make change stick, and importantly, that process of engaging our people in the idea of change. So I want to go back to where I think it all starts. That's a snap of me, I think, at about 12 months old. And I often joke that if you could have ultrasounded my mum's stomach with audio, that I was probably asking why in the womb. But I love this Mark Twain quote and this idea that there are two really significant days of your life, the day that you're born and the day that you work out why. I think it's interesting because we place so much attention to celebrating the day that we're born. But oftentimes, we haven't even given ourselves five minutes to sit down and really think about why it is that we're here, why it is that we do what we do. Now, you've been a very great, fantastic listening audience this morning, so I'm going to throw the challenge back out to you. I'm going to do a quick participation exercise, 30 seconds each. I want you to turn to someone on one side of you, and I want you to share with them the why it is that you do what you do, why you get out of bed in the morning, why it is that you head to the place that you work. Um, share that quickly. I'm going to time you. 30 seconds each. Go. Okay, swapping over if you haven't already. Okay, 10 more seconds. Okay, great, we'll bring it back in. Thank you so much for indulging me in that little exercise. I love the energy that comes into a room when people talk about their why. And I think it's a really interesting thing to reflect on as leaders to think about how often is it that you share your why? Do you know the why of the people that are in your team? Um, and do you know whether or not that aligns with the why of your organization? I want to speak to the journey of really how I came to know and understand that. My why started when I was 10 and I had an encounter with a homeless man on the side of the street in Perth. My mum had been shopping in a bookstore. I'd gotten sensationally bored trying to find Wally on the back page of the Where's Wally book. And so I'd wandered out into the street and seen this guy that was sitting on the footpath with his hat upturned that was begging for money. And you might not guess it, but I've always been reasonably extroverted. So 10-year-old me wandered over to this guy and said, what you doing? And he looked up at me with a grin and he said, I'm trying to earn enough for a feed. And so I looked down at what he had in his hat and there was $4.20 sitting in his hat. And I never, ever should have said what I said next. The typical 10-year-old, and for the parents in the room, you'll feel this one, kind of slipped past the keeper, and I said, that's not very much. And he chuckled, he said, nah, it's a good day. And I couldn't wrap my head around that. I thought, how's that a good day? I've been shopping with mum enough to know that doesn't go very far. And so I said, where do you live? He said, I don't have a house, I just crash wherever. 
And I had about two nanoseconds to take that in before mum dragged me away and gave me a stranger danger lecture that was medallion worthy. But that night, as I lay in bed and it bucketed with rain, all I could think about was how come by lottery of birth, I've got a roof over my head, I've got food in my stomach, and the guy that I met on the side of the street doesn't. I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know why that was the case. But I knew for me that there was something wrong about that. And that for me was this ignition of this passion that sat within me to want to help people like that, to want to improve the lives of those less fortunate and help create better outcomes in our organizations and in our society. Now, I was fortunate to get exposed to this model recently. The reason I got you to share your why is the understanding of its significance to yourself as a leader and to the role within organizations. And we'll talk about self first. Most of you hopefully will have seen the wonderful TED Talk Start With Why. If you haven't, chuck it on your viewing list for the weekend. And in it, he talks about the importance that so often we start outside the circle and we talk about the how and we talk about the what, but we so rarely get to the why. And the reason that matters is it's because at the why, at the core, is where we flick on the limbic part of the brain. And that's the part of the brain that drives human behavior and motivation. And so the, the importance of being able to identify that for yourself as a leader of change, as someone who's going to have to do things differently, step outside the square, be able to tap into an ongoing source of energy is absolutely pivotal. Now, I was fortunate off the back of some of the work that I'd been doing with charitable organizations in Australia and building businesses in remote indigenous communities to get asked by an Australian charity operating in Kenya to go over and start a microfinance project for them, working with a group of 22 women who are earning an average of 75 Australian cents a week for working more than 12 hours a day. And these women were trying to feed between 3 and 11 kids on that. It was just abject poverty like nothing I had ever seen. But it taught me a really powerful, it taught me so many powerful lessons, this experience in Kenya. But the one that I came to really, and I go back to all the time, that fundamentally shaped the way I think about change, was on a particular day when we were walking towards this giant sea container where we would teach business skills every afternoon. And I'd been told when I arrived in Kenya that the women had to walk about two and a half kilometers to get to the nearest source of clean drinking water. And on this particular day, we'd taken an alternative path through the slums. At about 400 meters from the sea container where we taught, we stumbled on what looked like a brand new well. And so I said through our Swahili interpreter, hold on, isn't that a well? And the answer came back, yes it is. And I thought, okay, well, that's a bit strange. Is it, is it broken? And the answer came back, no, it's not. Didn't quite make sense to me. So I was thinking, you know, much closer, not, it's still working. This is a well, might I add, that's built with probably about $20,000 worth of aid money by an organization every single one of you would know. And so I said to them, how come nobody drinks from this well? And the answer came back, well, this well is built on ancient battlegrounds, and there are bad spirits in the ground. And so we can't drink the water from this well, or we'll get bad spirits in us and we'll die. Now, it's interesting because you tell that story, and, and your natural reaction is kind of to want to smirk or laugh and say, oh, of course, it's something like that. But it's this really powerful lesson in change in that you've got a situation where the best of intentions, did best of intentions, you know, were these guys on the money that they needed a better and closer source of fresh drinking water? Absolutely. But because they'd failed to engage, to co-design, to in any way build a relationship with the people they were seeking to serve, to meet the needs of, the best of intentions went horribly awry and you had $20,000 worth of aid money that was sitting there for absolutely no purpose. And it's a, solution, it's, it's a problem that we can often think confined to the aid and development world, but I've seen play out so many times, be it from a consumer and customer point of view or employee point of view within organizations as well. That importance of making sure that we don't make assumptions. Once we are clear on our why we are doing things, well, making sure we don't make assumptions about that, but that we also don't make assumptions on how we then go about delivering. The organization that taught me the power of these two things combined in leading organizational change was this one. Hands up who knows them. Keep your hand up if you basically associate them with being pale, male, and stale. Yeah, okay, cool. So we're basically all on the same page about Rotary. Uh, so Rotary provided some of the seed capital for me to go and do the microfinance work in Kenya. 
And when I came back, as you know if you know Rotarians, there's one way it happens. You get accosted. You get accosted by Rotarians who come up to you and say, and why aren't you a member of our Rotary Club yet? And I looked at them and said, I don't think I belong in Rotary. They said, oh, no, we're doing things differently. You've got to come along and check it out. I said, all right. So went along, and they put this statistic up. Rotary's 1.2 million members. So the largest community service organization in the world have been running for 110 years. But only 2% under 30, and only 12% females in that membership. And I remember looking around the room trying to work out why no one else looked like they had alarm bells going off in their head. Because that is so not a healthy picture. I've since found out that 25% of their membership are over 70. We worry about Australia's demographic pyramid. Let's talk about Rotaries for a second. I thought, wow, this is an organisation that has an unbelievable why. They've nearly single-handedly eradicated polio from the planet. They help in pockets of disadvantage in every corner of the world. But because they had layered so much what and how on top of the why, nobody could get at the why anymore. And he had a generation of very community-focused, altruistic young leaders coming through who didn't see that as a place that they could contribute. And it's important that we think about what I call the Atticus Fringe approach to how we drive change. Once we've identified who it is that we're trying to change for, to serve the needs of, to access the opportunity for, we need to make sure we're putting ourselves in their shoes, not making assumptions about what it is that they want, and co-designing together to create that. And I put my hand up. This is one of those things that, for me, again, sparked that moment, said, I want to contribute. I want to try and do something to make a difference here. And I had this situation happen where overnight <laughs> I became the world's youngest president of a Rotary Club and was leading this global transformation through the 34,000 Rotary Clubs around the world to lift youth engagement and female participation. And then 12 months, we managed this new model we created to double global youth participation within Rotary. We've continued that onward march since then, creating this new framework for how it is that we better engage young people through focusing on how do we amplify the why and create new what and how where everyone feels welcome and feels part of what it is the organisation does. Now, I had the incredible privilege, and it was mentioned before, of leading the Youth Summit for the G20 last year. And I want to tell you this story because, for me, this, this was probably the most confronting a challenge to get given. When I got the call um, from the Prime Minister to say, will you lead this summit, um, it was, can you volunteer four hours a week and can you bring together about 125 global young leaders in Sydney for a four-day summit as part of the process? And I, I did some research. I didn't know too much about the G20 when I started, and I had zero government relations experience. I thought, what have I been thrown into here? And one of the first things I found out was there are 1.5 billion young people within the G20. And all of a sudden, I was meant to have responsibility for making sure that they had a voice within this global economic dialogue. And I thought, I can't do that with four voluntary hours a week <laughs> and by running a couple of day summit in the middle of July. We need to try and find a way of lifting the bar so much higher on the role young people can play within this dialogue. And I remember about two months later, there was this meeting at the Shangri-La in Sydney. And they've got these people called Sherpas in the G20. They're the right-hand people of all the world leaders. So David Cameron and Barack Obama and Vladimir Putin, all their right-hand people are sitting around this rectangle table at the Shangri-La. And I'm sitting next to Richard Goida, who's heading the B20 summit, and Tim Costello, who's heading this civil society summit. And I can't tell you for the life of me what they said during their presentations, because I was hyperventilating the entirety of the time. I have never had a panic attack in my life, and that is not a great place to debut it. I was literally hardcore breathing, trying to be like, y y what am I doing here? What am I doing here? What am I doing here? Because we had 10 minutes to sit there with all these right-hand people with world leaders and say, this is what we're going to do over the next 12 months, and here are the policy priorities that we're, we're going to shoot for. And so I sat there and thought, if we want to go from here, and unfortunately the bar for young people was here. It had been tokenistic engagement, been the leaders popping in to have a quick happy snap. We hadn't once in the eight years the Youth Summit had been running seen leaders take up young people's recommendations. 
So I sat there and went, let's go for broke. When we go, I, I, my, one of my life sayings is when you go, go big. And so I sat there and said, if we are going to be more, if we promise that we will be more pragmatic, more evidence-based, more collaborative than we have ever been, will you promise that you will give us a seat at the table at every dialogue throughout the G20 this year? And they kind of called my bluff and they said yes. And so overnight we had this exponential increase in our workload, but we had this unbelievable opportunity for the first time in history to have young people sit at every table and put policy submissions into every G20 table. Now that was completely dawning. I quit my job, I used to live in Perth. I quit my job, I flew across the country on a red-eye flight, I crashed on my mate's couch, and we started trying to work out how to do this, because we had no clue. And we were really fortunate that there were so many people that were willing to share their ideas and their how, and we could put together a framework. But it wasn't easy because there were so many people who doubted us. We came with no authority in hand to the table. We didn't have the weight of business. We didn't have the strength of the voice of civil society. And so we had to create that for ourselves. And I remember one day I was called in, we had a particular senator, and this is not reflective of our experience with the government at large, because the treasurer and the foreign minister were absolutely wonderful. But a particular senator we were dealing with, and he'd called me into his office, he was sitting across the table from me, and he was angry at me because we were about three months out from the summit and we still had two keynote speaker slots we had to fill. And for anyone who's planned a conference that's global and you're trying to get those sort of speakers, that's not that uncommon. But boy was I in his firing line that day and I was trying to explain to him all of this policy work that we were doing and everything we were working on behind the scenes. And he said to me, you've got to understand, I do not care whether or not your summit produces something or nothing. It ticks my box the exact same way. I thought, wow. So you basically don't care if we do anything worthwhile or whether or not we do something that's so world changing and earth shattering that it changes the way that young people perceive within the G20. You don't care. This was then followed by, you've got to remember your youth and nobody really cares. I can't tell you how, how disheartening that was. Like I walked out of that meeting and I was so, it was like a, I don't know, a 20 ton truck had run me over, I was so flat. I remember picking up the phone and calling one of my mentors and saying, I just had a senator yell at me. I did that in a very tame form. There were, there were a couple of swear words in there too. Yell at me across the table and tell me that basically we're absolutely idiots for thinking we can do any of this. And it was so great. She, she said to me, oh, you're first tearing apart by a senator. I'll give you your badge next time I see you. I was like, that's awesome. You know, just totally reframing the way it was. Like, that means you're doing something. That means you, you're driving change when you know people like that who have that desire just to keep it the way it is because it's easy and it's comfortable and it ticks a box. That you can start getting on their nerves because you believe there's something more cap within it. You're capable of something. And we had the most extraordinary year with the way it played out. Not only did it become the first youth summit to present to every economic dialogue, I had the privilege of going and addressing Christine Lagarde, Jack Yellen, Janet Liu, all of the foreign ministers, I'm sorry, the finance ministers and central bank governors. I had the opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with Barack Obama and discuss our global plan for youth unemployment and the work we were doing around empowering women and to address the UN and to write the official paper for the UN and the G20 leaders on the role of youth unemployment and entrepreneurship in changing our, our, well, our global reality, but particularly within the context of the G20 and the Sustainable Development Goals. It was a huge year, and it was the first year, most critically, that ever had young people seen G20 leaders take up their recommendations. Brisbane Summit, paragraph 10 of the G20 Leaders Decora Declaration, we got everything that the representatives of those 1.5 billion young people um, throughout the world had been working so hard at last year. And it was an incredible showing of what can happen when you believe in a vision and you work out hard towards it. When you set those really clear, smaller goals that you break that giant goal of getting in a declaration like that or being able to successfully drive a big change project. When you can break it down to what needs to happen by January and what needs to be achieved in that meeting in April. And you can start ebbing away at it. And you can navigate and build relationships with stakeholders so that they can chorus with you and not be counterweights or counter voices to the conversation. It was a really powerful learning. 
And I think for me it did speak about the idea that there will always be doubters who don't believe that change is possible, who don't believe that something so grand or so substantial can drive change, that it can happen. And that importance of making sure you have the framework set up for yourself as a leader so that you are able to be resilient when those knocks do come, when those doubters do speak, having mentors in your corner, having people you can call on for advice so that roadblocks just become something you have to work over, through, under, whatever, it was absolutely critical. I'm going to finish with one final thought. Um, this is a, a snap that was taken earlier this year. I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity to go on a, an expedition to Antarctica. And um, was there with 100 Australian entrepreneurs and we were having a, a think tank basically on the role that entrepreneurship could play in creating a better Australia. And it, after we crossed the Antarctic Circle, we had this incredible opportunity to do what they call the polar plunge, which, as you can probably guess from the image, is jumping in uh, to the polar water. And it's about negative one degree uh, in that water right there. The best way I can describe it is it's as though you've had 10 espressos in one, but you can't feel anything. So they tie a rope around you because quite often your body does shut down and it doesn't respond too well and it's not kind of the glamorous Baywatch rescue mission when you're in the Antarctic. It doesn't really add up. But I think this was a really interesting point for me of thinking about that idea of, of jumping out into change and that idea of standing on the precipice and having that trepidation and fear because the unknown is scary. And it's okay to acknowledge that. It's okay for that to be something that you don't... Very few people, if any, I think people lie when they say they sit comfortably in the uncomfortable. But having that preparedness, that courage to start there and jump out and see what happens. Because you hit the water and you feel more alive than you've ever felt. And at that point, you're not fixed, you're not frozen, as I learned. You can swim, you can move, you can change direction. You can create the framework so you're getting that feedback and response and you're able to use that to continually inform the way it is that you move forward and the way it is you seek to progress. But I think the idea being that endless conversation about change, talking about it, having meetings, having countless plan after plan after plan put together that kind of gathers more and more dust or paper sitting on someone's desk waiting for approvals, that's actually the barrier to change. It's having that preparedness to step out, to start here and go, I think tomorrow can be there. Let's try go for that, that really matters. Thank you for having me. <laughs>